Thank you for listening to interview with DJ Malterna. Please like, subscribe, and share um, if you're watching on my YouTube channel. And if you're on my uh, podcast, thank you for, for listening, djnocturnal.com. Uh, I am joined by um, uh, a, the gothic duo, father and son. I got Greg Bullock and, and his son, Bryden Bullock, cyborg amok. Yes. <laughs> thank you guys for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you both on the show. You know, this is the first time I ever had um, a father and son on the show. So um, there's always a first time, but it's, it's so wonderful to have you guys. I mean, I'm so glad you're making music together. Yeah, we like it. We, you know, we, it started out um, as an experiment oh, a couple yeah. years ago, um, and it just transformed itself into uh, a full-on project. And we've been having a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, originally we didn't tell anybody we were father and son. The, the recordings had come out, and and um, we just didn't say anything, but having the same last name in the project, <laughs> yeah, you know, and then when people started looking at the pictures, it was obvious we weren't, uh, <laughs> we weren't brothers, <laughs> you know, so. Um, it helps when you live in the same house. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, the interesting thing for this project was that it started out in 2019 with the two of us working together, he, uh, Brian and doing some drums on some songs that I had, you know, written over the years. And then um, so, uh, COVID hit. And for us, as far as the music was concerned, it didn't really change anything because we were already living in the same house. And now we're locked down in the house with nothing to do but work on music. Stuff. Yeah. Right? So ultimately, um, we did two EPs which uh, last year we combined into a single LP, which is what's currently mm -hmm. out there now. And um, I did a couple of solo projects because I had the time to do it. And uh, we have our studio here. So we do, we do a lot of the work, at least the pre-work here. And then we record in another studio where we can do live drums and live vocals, right? Yes, it's on Red Meg. So what was it like, um, uh, Brighton, growing up with, with you know, in the, with a musical father? It was interesting, and I feel very blessed. And my parents constantly remind me of how, uh, how blessed I got because, uh, you know, both my parents ended up working in the music industry or in some form of uh, entertainment, whether it be small or large. So uh -huh. I've had that whole experience my whole life. And then on top of that, it kind of just having my, um, like you said, my dad, and then also my mom who's a singer and played in uh, school bands and stuff, but working in the entertainment industry, it all just kind of snowballed into being this, into me being a musician. So it was very, it was, I was, bl I'm blessed and I tried, uh, appreciate it every day. It, it's also very weird and, uh, and very cool at the same time. It's yeah, I was just thinking that you, you must be like one of the coolest, um, you know, a, a musician because you got a you got a you know, a father that that kind of guided you through. Well, some may say, say that, <laughs> some may say that. I mean, no, that's really that is a blessing. That's a, that's really the word for it because you know, a lot of a lot of kids don't get that that. Mm -hmm you know, that um, support. That yeah, it's have. definitely helpful because I, I find now, even as a high schooler, that between also my parents, oh, because they work in the music industry and our musicians, they can both say, hey, you know, you have a dream. We're going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. So through them, uh, through first them and then second, you know, dealing with a bunch of, you know, getting to learn from tons and tons of professionals and the most professional places I can. Um, I find that I definitely am blessed that I'm not the most organized person in the world, but I tried to have a good level of uh, professionalism, even as a teenager. Well, you got your teacher there. That's for sure. I, that's well, the first thing I recognized when I realized that it was a father and son. I was just saying, wow, this is gonna be an interesting interview. Because, you know, I think, um, you know, when you have um, a mentor, 
somebody who can guide you through, you know how it is, it's so difficult in the music industry to get started in there. And then you're like, oh, what I do next? What I do next? I got all this. And then you got a father who's right beside you. I mean, that's a great guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, I've had a career in the music industry, a lot of it in production, lighting and, and yeah. uh, lighting director and uh, mm -hmm. lighting crew chief and touring in, in that respect. And I've always had a studio and always created music and always put out projects all the way back to the cassette days. I did an album um, many years ago. Um, so for me, um, it, it, it's been interesting to be able to guide him to the places he needs to get to a lot faster than I figured it out. Yeah, exactly. I didn't really have anybody to figure mm -hmm. it out. I had the, you know, me and my friends figured it out on our own. Yeah, I'm I mean, like, back then we, we didn't have YouTube, you know. No, <laughs> no. And I talked to I talked to a lot of people now in the that you know in the scene, and we all the older ones like myself all have the same thing. We all came up in the eighties. You know, we started out listening to um, Sisters of Mercy and and Susie and the Banshees and De uh, Depeche Mode and all those kinds of bands. And um, it was a different scene. It wasn't the general, you know, the basic MTV thing and um, the, the, you know, trying to come up in that, in that world, you, you know, you played your tail off, you played in clubs, you played a lot of covers. Um, and I have, you know, I've waded through all that. And then, you know, I found out over the years, what what really was important and what was you know what difficulties I had to go through that I really didn't probably need to to go into. So for us and my wife, who uh, Kathy um, is a uh, a singer, a choir singer, she's traveled the world through college choirs and and done a bunch of things um, for herself, and she's also in the music industry. I worked in the, the back of house productions, uh, light sound and all that kind of stuff. And she worked in the front of house where she managed the, did the dressing, you know, managed the theaters and the venues and did the front of house management, mm -hmm. which we still do. And so it's been interesting for us, for Bryden, because he has never known a life where he's not been backstage. He's not been with, you know, very famous people. I have pictures of him when he was, a, you know, infant with in the arms backstage of people that, you know, er, many people in the world know um, as artists. And so it's interesting be, that he doesn't know anything but to be in this, this um, business. And um, for me, it, it was completely different. And I don't, I don't want him to have to work as hard as I did in order to yeah, get Yeah, that's why I was just saying, wow, this is a really, um, that's what the first thing I recognize. You know, they have a lot of musicians who have a father and son, you know, like Leonard Cohen and his son, and his son Adam, mm -hmm. who produced that last record, um, You Want It Darker. I think he did that one. But, you know, that's different though. You know, you, you have father and son, but no one, like, not that many that work together and you know perform live and make music together in that way yeah. so i think that's amazing uh yeah yeah i mean it's been it's been been really awesome that way um you know sometimes it's challenging because you know i mean for the most part i'm i'm writing the music and the lyrics and putting the and mm -hmm. you know putting the stuff together originally initially you know in the studio and then I give Bryden the um, the song from there to come up with his backing vocals and and the drum all the drum tracks. Oh wow, that's so that's collaboration. Yeah, so we'll go into the studio and he'll take the drum tracks that I had done in in the computer with loops and whatnot, and sometimes I play them and create them that way. But he'll take those and turn them into his own. So what you actually hear on the recording is. Um, is what Bryden has come up with on his own based on the ideas that I gave him. And that works with everything in, in our music. Um, Adam Vaccarelli, who is our engineer and the studio that we record at, and we record the drums and the vocals at Adam's because um, here I don't have a good room acoustic. So the things where you use open mics like vocals and drums and guitar, uh, mic and guitar amps, 
we do those at a, a legitimate studio and this is a kind of a production studio where I can do all the keyboards, the rough vocals, the electronic drums and everything like that. We can do those here. Um, but Adam will take my bass lines that I play on the keyboards mm -hmm. and write on the keyboards and he will actually apply a, a real bass to them. And that's who plays bass on our records. And we've had two guitar players play for us. And we have another one, uh, a third one now for this next record. And um, guitar players for the live, for the, the, you know, seem they're hard to come by for some reason. I don't know. I think our music isn't mainstream enough. It's not classic rock. It's not metal. I mean, in, in, yeah, in, how would you classify your music? I was going to ask you that. We classify it as post-punk synth rock. It kind of, I mean, it's, it's got elements of Gothic and elements of, of industrial, but I mean, yeah. for us or for me, and you can ask him all about his musical influences, but for me as a keyboard player, primarily my, my influences started out in the seventies with all the prog stuff. Mm. But I was also way into the doors and Johnny Cash and people like that. And I think, yeah. That, I feel like I was goth before goth existed. From you know what? I, I was just gonna say, Jim Morrison is actually the goth. The beginning, I I, I thought he was goth even before the word came out. Right, exactly. Really do, Me yeah. Too. And look at Johnny Cash. I was just thinking of him the other day. We talked about we've talked about doing a cover of a Johnny Cash song. We haven't decided what we would like to do, but I looked at, like he's the man in black. Everything he's everything he's about is like, you know darkness and and he had so many things yeah. in his life and so his life was so dark in, in so many respects and and the last video he did of hurt that you know trent reznor's nine inch nail song that was the oh, most that dark was, that was actually, video. I actually like that better i actually like that better than the original yeah me too me too <laughs> so yeah. i mean you know i will i feel like i was you know, listen, I started listening to Sisters of Mercy and Depeche Mode and, and those bands in the late Gary Newman. Um, and I never even thought of the word goth and, you know, post punk and, and listening to all that stuff. It's just mm -hmm. that's how, that's how I came up. That's where I am. That's where my headspace is. That's how I write even through the 90s with Nine Inch Nails came out. And I mean, there's there's metal bands. Uh, symphonic metal bands that I like that are, I think, borderline on goth in some way, maybe a sub genre like Nightwish. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think goth is such a general, broad, <clears throat> excuse me, it's such a general broad term now. And yeah. um, when I think for us, I think we're kind of a modern coast punk if, if there's any genre. Well, do, you, do you have any favorite prog bands? Do I have any favorite prog bands? Yeah, like your inspiration for the... Um. Oh my God. See, now he's never going to stop. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll keep it. I'll keep it. I mean... No, you know why? I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, classic music, classical rock and prog and progressive rock. Okay. And So I started out as a Pink Floyd. Oh yeah, there we go. Pink Floyd is probably my most prominent influence um, of all bands. For the most part, um, nice. and there's yes, and Jethro Tull were were influential. Um, early days, like Black Sabbath, um, was a band that I listened to, and they're not prog, but they were at the time they were creating their genre. Um, I mean, and then as time went on, I still continued to listen to Yes, and um, you know Jethro Tull as prog bands, but they. They even changed their sounds. Genesis, you know, the 80s. Oh, Genesis. yeah, that was, I was going to say Genesis, one of, with Peter Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, and all that, all that, all that, you know, I mean, if you think about the lyrics and the stories and the things that they told, it was a lot of dark, a lot of dark uh, music going on in that, in the prog. Rush is another one. It's a huge, was a huge influence on me. But somewhere, because I was into keyboards and somewhere, around the time that I heard Speak and Spell from Depeche Mode when that came out, uh, Autobahn from Kraftwerk and Gary Newman uh, with his with Cars. I think those 
they really hit me too. And it kind of changed my direction. And at that point in my, in my, cause look, I couldn't, as a keyboard player, I didn't have the, the time when I was growing up as a little, as a kid, or I couldn't, my parents couldn't afford for me to have, you know, a lot of keyboards around. So playing, learning to play like Rick Wakeman and all, you know, that kind of, you know, keyboard player was never going to, was out of the question. So my influence was, became more of the work of, you know, Gary Newman and Tears for Fears and Depeche Mode and those guys, because it was a simplified um, way to, to approach the keyboards. So that's where I, how, you know, where I ended up. Um, what, how, what about um, what about you, Brian? Who's your um, inspiration, musical inspiration? Oh well, I'm pretty I'm pretty all over the place. Like, there's not really anything that I go towards. Recent now, as a drummer, I'd say, without a doubt, the biggest ones are. Um, I definitely, without a doubt, say uh, Neil Peart of Rush. So basically, so pretty much Rush. Led Zeppelin, um, Pink Floyd, um, and then also like those are my first like early early inspirations and biggest early inspirations when it came to drumming. Um, oh, who else? There's so many good ones to pick from. Yeah. I'd say mostly Rush and, and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd though, because coming up early playing music, those were the bands that I was like heavy 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 into also you know stuff like elp and carl palmer and yes you know but I, i'd say mostly rush led zeppelin and pink floyd and then as i as i got older i started to go more into kind of everything else so as i've gone on i've just listened to more and more stuff like you know i've gotten into more contemporary stuff stuff like I don't know, you know, stuff you hear on the radio every day, like uh, Post Malone or, or like mm -hmm. Beach World or something. And 21 then like Pilots. 21 Pilots. And then also just some of the more underground stuff. I'm very much into indie rock, but like the newer kind of like alternative indie rock. One of my favorite artists is Dayglow. I love him to death. And uh, people like the Wallows and other stuff like that. But also recently... I've gotten into very heavy into the grunge, the night, the early, the like the mid eighties and nineties grunge movement. But like all the, all the stuff, like even the earlier stuff like Green River or, or Dinosaur Jr. And, and, and stuff like that. So I try and go all over the place. Cause even then I have, I love, you know, James Brown funk is, you know, I love listening mm. to him. I That's good. It. I mean, you guys like kind of support each other and you have, uh, you, you both have, you bring something to the table together, it seems. That's really, I've, that's awesome. Yeah. I've been taught with everything and I try and I listen to pretty much everything. So every single genre of music, I try and take something from. So recently I've been listening to grunge and in recent years I've gotten into the punk and grunge movements and indie movements. So in my drumming on some of the tracks, you know, there's some of those heavier influences there. So I know you guys are probably always together since you live together, you make music together. Do, do you guys, um, do you, uh, do you guys get along? I'm sure you get along. Do you, do you ever like, uh, do you know how you have, you have, you have your bad mates and you talk to them about certain things. Do you ever, do you ever have to worry about keeping things from your dad? You know, some kids, they, <laughs> I mean, they don't they don't share everything with their father, right? But the it seems like it seems like you guys have a have a have a close bond. Of course, I would think that you have that connection where you can just tell your dad anything you want. Well, right? I, I, don't, I don't think we would have survived this long. If, well, that's a if, that's a good answer, yeah. Like yeah, as a I mean, band, we wouldn't have gone this long if yeah. I, we weren't open with each other about everything. Yeah. Well, it's just in general the way he's been brought up, the way. Kathy and I have brought him up is we don't lie to him and we want him and we tell and we want to know what's going on in his life. We're not always good. Maybe we're not always maybe going to like it or we may not approve of it, but we will accept it because it's his life. And the only thing that we really do is try and steer him in the right direction if we think he's going to make some colossal mistake. Otherwise, sometimes I let him like I'm a little bit better at it than than 
my wife, but sometimes I'll let him make a mistake or I'll let him do something stupid that a teenager would do anyway, because that's the way he's going to learn. If I tell him that that's wrong, he's going to go do it anyway. And then he's going to come back and say, you were wrong or, you know, I was wrong. I should have listened to you. So if he just makes the mistake in the first place and I don't say anything, then he, uh, as long as it's not going to hurt him or anybody else, you know, it's, better, it's, a, it's a good way to learn. I mean, he has some situations, some circumstances go on recently that, um, you know, some kids might not want to talk to their parents about peer pressures and things like that. And um, he's talked to us. We, and we've just given him the best guidance we can. And as far as a band is concerned, some of that stuff has come out um, in the project. Like we wrote a song called uh, Choice Not Taken, which was on the LP. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time that we were working on that song, Bryden kind of discovered that he has some bouts of, of depression. And I'm like, well, buddy, sorry, but the, you know, you kind of got that for me. I've had bouts of depression all my life. And I always, you know, I've taught him that like, you know, you get through it and you're always going to come out the other side. And even though you're in that dark tunnel into that dark space, um, it'll be okay. You know, you just have to ride it out. And um, so we wrote the song about it. And that song is a little bit of my message to him. So, that, you know, someday I'm not going to be here any longer. And he's going to have be able to look back on that song and think about what we wrote and what we talked about and how it came about. And have that in the back of his mind so that if he does have one of those dark periods, he'll be able to work his way through it and know that it'll come out on the other side and everything will be okay. And that you know depression is something that lots of people have and nobody wants to talk about mm -hmm. but it's a real thing and it, it affects many many people and so we just put it out there you know and that's well, just one of the aspects of our relationship that mm -hmm. how it affects our music that comes out in no music. no that that's beautiful i think it's i think it's wonderful that you're um that you're uh, you're guiding him you know through his um to adulthood and all that i think that's beautiful i think that's i, I mean, think so that's, that's wonderful too i mean we don't see that often you know i mean we don't know about it but yeah yeah i mean my life you know for better or for worse was challenging as i was growing up and i just try to you know he's going to make mistakes but we try and uh we try and minimize the mistakes yeah so i know you released an, an lp uh called called the self-titled lp yes um well last year right yes. cyborg it's called cyborg i'm just like the name and um it was, so that, that was the latest one are you guys going to be coming out with something new again you have something in the works yes actually we just um the album came the cyborg amok came out in june okay. and i was working with another band uh last year playing keyboards and they were a great bunch of guys um, but I wanted, we have a bunch of material that we've been working on and talking about, and we just want to put out another record now. So what we did was recently, we just put out another video for dancing on the floor to see a tranquility, which comes off of the cyborg amok, um, LP. And then that'll be the last thing that comes out to push and, and help us move the cyborg amok, um, project you know the L first lp along we have a new ep or i mean lp that we are working on and it'll we're hoping that it comes out in the fall late summer early fall um we're currently in the studio recording uh tracks for it and do you have a, do you have a name for the new album or you're still um, well you don't uh, want to release that yet okay well yes we have a name and it's I don't know. If, <laughs> should we put it out there? I guess. And you don't have to. I'm yeah, just, yeah. I mean, um, we it's we have a name, and we have seven songs for the project. Mm -hmm. um, we've recorded drum tracks on three of the songs, vocal tracks on three. We're actually we are doing a cover. We're doing a David Bowie cover. Oh wow! Okay. Um, so I can, I'll say that. 
Um, you could, because I, I know you don't, you don't write many covers. So I'm, I'm, I was going to ask you about that. So that's great. Yeah, we decide, we actually in our set, in our live set, we do a few covers. We do Cars by Gary Newman. Um, we do Enjoy the Silence by Depeche Mode. We do uh, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, uh, which Bryden sings. He also sings Cars, uh, plays drums and sings lead in, the, in those. And then we have, um, what's the other one? We want to, uh, oh, Golden Years, Bowie. Oh, okay. Oh, so all of those songs, for the most part, we try and do our own way. But the one that's most our own way is Golden Years. We've kind of reinvented that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the rest, we have 16 songs in our set and all the rest are, are originals. I'm not real big on covers. I, don't, I like, to, like to do original music. Um, but the covers that we do do, we feel are... Uh, come from a place of our influences, songs we just really enjoy, and songs that people enjoy. Other, you know, the, other people enjoy. Um, I I know some of the themes of your music is from life experiences. Um, can you give us an example of one? Well, I, I just mentioned uh, choice not taken. That that's you know making that decision on on uh, you know in a, in a in a really dark place. Uh, oh. Making, you know, trying to reason and make make the right decision. Um, one of the songs is called "Beyond Me" on the uh, LP, and that was written um, for my dad who had passed away. And oh. so, basically, when we do that song, when we did that song, that's I wrote it, but you know, Bryden, it's his, it was his grandfather who he did know. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Um, Dancing on a floor of the sea of tranquility was for me um, about finding out that when my dad, I was messing around with a song in, in the studio and my dad called me one night and told me he, he had cancer. And um, so dancing on the floor of the sea of tranquility for me was my way of dealing with that, have that thought at the time. Um, in, I think in the long run and for the audience, the song is more about, you know, have losing, losing something or someone in your life and then dealing with that loss yeah. and, and how, and how you deal with it, I guess. Um, oh. I, I don't know, I guess there's other song, Newer Dark Age, just that was written. We wrote that during, uh. COVID. during COVID when we were we had a kind of a dark I mean we wrote the lyrics the song was actually written earlier musically um, it was released as an instrumental on a solo CD I did mm, don't remember I think it was 2016 or something but um, then we put music to it and actually created um, a whole different song you know different vibe for the song a lot of our songs on the first LP probably more than half of them were songs that I had written and were laying around and then um, Bryden the original idea for Cyborg Amok was that Bryden and I would take songs that we had that I had already written and we would approach them as um, a band um. and we had a guitar player we were working with at the time before COVID and so we we arranged the songs as for band for guitar bass drums and keyboards and vocals. And COVID came around and we lost our guitar player because he couldn't, uh, his wife basically wouldn't let him come out and hang out with us anymore uh, for you know good reason. Um, so because it was just the two of us, we continued on and we wrote more music, which was the second EP, which we had a guitar player uh, do his tracks remotely for us. So then, um, we decided to put them, uh, put them both together and create the LP and just put that out by itself and re, you know, just go in a different direction with the band. And it's still, it was, it's still just the two of us because we have a studio bass player and 
we have guitar players come in and play the guitar tracks. But the thing about the thing about um, post punk and and kind of that genre that we we hang around in is that there's so many bands that go out and do it as duos with backing tracks. And so for us, we've had conversations about, you know, bringing in band members and stuff like that, but it just always seems to go back to the two of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's where we are. Yeah. Um, you know, we find a guitar player that, that gels with us, then we'll go back and, and then they can, you know, come in and we can, they can be a part of it. But um, so, we'd, uh, love, we'd love for that to happen. So I, I know you mentioned earlier that your, your wife is also uh, in, in the music world. She sings yeah. and all that. Would you ever consider having her in the band too? Um, I don't know <laughs> if we could have her in the band. She's not, she's not a rock. First, well, <laughs> She's not a rock singer. She's a choir singer, and she's got a, a, a fantastic yeah, yeah. choir voice. Yeah. Um, but when she sings rock and roll, she sings it too pretty and too perfect. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> but she is. If she's the she has done some vocals for us. Um, oh, on okay. My solo, one of my solo songs called uh, "Legends of St. John Woods." Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, she's the background vocals in the in the chorus. Oh, okay. The female oh, background nice. vocals. Um, would we all work together in a band very well? I don't know. I, I'm I don't not know. sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we're she we're two A type personalities. I mean, <laughs> um, she's in the music business. We own a company together, and we produce concerts and festivals and and things and. Um, she's pretty, uh, she's pretty tied up with that. I'm for, I guess I'm, I'm pretty lucky that I can, that I have the time and the, and the ability to do as much music as I do. Um, so are, are you guys both looking forward to any live shows in the future? We had done a live, live show in, uh, last year mm -hmm. and it turned out, I thought it was, a, it was pretty it was awesome. Pretty at the, cool. at the, the evil expo. And then, um, we had a video shoot that we were going, we were doing in December and we ended up uh, postponing it because of, we got another wave of COVID. We're here on the East coast. We're in New Jersey in, in, mm -hmm. in the States. Mm -hmm. So at that point we had another wave of COVID and I, I couldn't put, I just wasn't going to put 60 or a hundred people in a closed room for four or five hours together um yeah. to do this video so i postponed the video and then what happened is the money the money that we had set aside to do that video we ended up taking it and shifting it over um and putting it and having after i mean discussion with between the two of us and, and our manager we have we do have a manager we took he you know he's like look do another video for the record before you put your new record out so um, so we took the money that we were going to do the live video and a live gig, and we put it into this new video that we had just put out a couple weeks ago. And um, so now we're back. We asked, the answer to your question is kind of we plan on doing live shows in the, in the near future. Um, hopefully this coming summer we'll, we'll start going out and do, going, doing some live things. But at the yeah, moment, hopefully, hopefully it'll be better all around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the moment right now, we, we could go out and do some things, but we're really focusing on trying to get this record done because we think that, you know, in the summer, we can try and start to push some of the new songs on the record, plus what we've had on the other, uh, on the, the older record. And then by next fall, when the record comes out, we'll be ready to go out and, you know. Really so we're looking at the fall then. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping, um, I think the fall for the record, I think hopefully by the middle of the summer, sometime in the summer, we can start doing some shows. Are you looking um, at uh, uh, CDs or uh, vinyl? Or um, I think we'll have some CDs. My son here, mm -hmm. he's got a whole theory on all that stuff. And he's like, I come up in the, I'm, I'm a vinyl I you know, I come up in the vinyl era. I mean, I remember 45s and 78. So um, but Bryden, 
Well, tell them what your thoughts are on that. Why we we did digital and not. Did oh. you, you're not really talking much. Well, you're talking. You I know. I'm, I'm I'm gonna stop. I'm, I'm gonna, he doesn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> I'm going to stop for a minute. <laughs> um, I, my theory growing up, uh, you know, obviously being younger is that everything's moving more digitally. Like I don't, I go out to the stores nowadays. I want to go buy a CD or a vinyl. The vinyl stores are closed and I can't find any CDs anymore. And though, I, though I'm though i someone who enjoys, you know, flipping through CD covers and flipping through vinyl and looking up, looking at who did what and who, uh, who mastered what and who like produced what, the whole thing is like now things are moving a lot more digitally and stuff like Spotify and SoundCloud or whatever comes along mm -hmm. next. It's all very digital. And uh, the way I, I feel that is, is because like, like everything is just so short att attention span right now. Like, like you no longer have to go out to the store. I can go on my phone. I can download an album. Mm -hmm. And if you're a musician, okay, well then, and, or you're intrigued by that kind of stuff on about looking through the album cover art and stuff like that, you know, your regular everyday person either doesn't care, doesn't really know about it, or, you know, because of today's like social media climate, everyone has such short attention spans that no one cares to go and dig through a, a battle. Do you think it's important to have a nice um, sleeves, a nice cover on the? Oh yeah. yeah, very important. I still think it's important. If you're, especially if you're, if you're a new band, if you're not a new band, then you can get away with it because your names will sell uh, records. Your name alone will get intrigue. But if you're not a known band, then the album cover art you use says a lot about who you are, about what that project means and i look at album cart uh, the, the album cover art or single cover art and look at it okay and say okay how does this connect the song or is this cool because if it's cool then i think it's you know then i'm more apt to probably look at it wow okay wow this is that's a beautiful um discussion we've been having here uh so if somebody wanted to check out your music cyborgamok.com yeah cyborgamok.com is our main uh website we have um links there that will take you to Bandcamp where you can buy our our uh current lp um on digital if somebody really wanted the cd they could um we have them and they can contact us through our website at um uh info at cyborgamok.com uh, Mm -hmm. um and we can get it to them but i mean for the most part on this one we're we're just selling it through Bandcamp. it's actually on it's on spotify which we don't really support but people use it and people listen to it um it's on itunes it's it's all over the place but the only way that we benefit from the sales of our music is through Bandcamp. um the next and it Go back to your your original question. Um, the next record will be on Bandcamp. It will also be everywhere else, just you know, digitally. And we will do um, we will do CDs. Um, I would like to do vinyl of both of our LPs wow. if there's you know a point that we could justify it, because you know if they're in a, they cost a lot of money to produce yeah um you know digital i can i produce digital here pretty inexpensively um doing the cds and the and the um vinyl you know it ha we have to be able to justify it because i mean i'm right now we've we're we've had talks with a couple of different labels for this next lp but i mean i did the you know pretty much everything that i've put out so far has been on, on the gabworks label which is my own label and um so are you so, thinking about another label on the, the for the next one? We don't know. I mean, okay. if I can, what my the only the biggest issue that we have right now is distribution. Mm. Um, 
you know, we're not, I mean, we we're distributed on Bandcamp and other places, but um, we don't have a, we don't have any kind of a machine behind distribution. So, you know, doing interviews like this always helps and it's great, but um, I don't know. It seems like a late, it, it's the, it's always that story. I see, you know, when I follow social media conversations and stuff, it's always, is a label really worth it in, in today's uh, music world? Because you can put out all the records you want on your own uh, without using a label. Um, but how do you get that push? How do you get that, that machine behind your product to get it out there for people to actually um, hear it and, and buy it? And um, also the other side of it is that we're looking potentially at um, labels from the standpoint that um, in order to do live, live shows, it's always beneficial to work with a, a label in the sense that you can go, they, if, if they have bands that are similar to, uh, to the kind of music, the kind of genre that you're doing, um, they can line, align you with, with their other bands. <clears throat> you can go out and do a bill of three or four bands, often basically the same label, and get shows that way. And we find it difficult to get shows because we are, um, you know, we're not playing classic rock. We're not playing metal. We're not playing jazz. We're not, we're not playing things that the club scene, um, you know, was looking for. And the places that we want to play are the places that are, um, have, you know, bands coming in that are basically so usually associated with, with labels, it seems to me. I'm um, seeing a lot of these shows in New York and Philly and, you know, places, Boston, closer to us. Um, so I guess the question is up in the air about the label, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm, we're, well, that, that's why we're having a conversation, you know, with a few different people. Yeah. Um, I think just for the, mainly for the distribution, I don't want anybody to come in and, and um, reinvent our records. That's, that's not what we're looking for, but we are looking for help with distribution and with um, aligning us with some of the other bands that are similar to us uh, that we could go out and do shows with. And I think that's kind of how we're looking at it. All right. So uh, Cyber Amok, Amok uh, yeah. dot com and also on the band camp and also you're on social media, I know, Facebook yeah. and um um instagram i believe and twitter i think yes. right yep. yeah all right so many places all right well you know thank you very much and big shout out to michael Nagy, as well yeah, yeah and, we, love, uh, we love michael he helps us a lot he's uh he's a good friend and he's mm -hmm. uh, he's 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 um doing some really good work for us and getting us helping pointing us in the right direction um yeah. so you know Yes, big shout out to Michael. Yeah, and you guys, you know, congratulations on your on your album, the new one coming out as well, and you know your team. Uh, it's a great team. So hang in there, and you know, and uh, learn from your dad and learn from your son. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You can't you can't be in this business by yourself on your own. You need help. You know. Yeah. You need to help each other. Mm -hmm. You need to be a part of the community, and and that's what we're trying to do. You know? So, well, you know, thank you both for, for joining me. And, and if you're watching on this uh, YouTube channel, please like, subscribe, and share and comment. And if you're watching on my uh, podcast, thank you for listening. All right, I'm going to let me just stop the thank you. Thank you both for coming on the thank show. You. Let me just uh, stop, the, the pleasure. stop the recording here.